Alright, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 18. And in screencast number two, we are going to continue our discussion on the phylum nematoda. Now remember, the animals that we're talking about here have a common name, and we call these animals roundworms. Now we're going to talk about um, the digestive system in screencast number two. We're also going to look at the nervous system. We're going to look a little bit at the reproductive system, and then towards the end of the screencast, we're going to look at some representative members of this phylum. Now when you look at the digestive system of the nematodes, you're going to see that the digestive system itself is actually a pretty simple um, digestive system. It consists of a mouth, consists of a muscular pharynx, a non-muscular intestine, so it's going to be a little bit different from ours. Um, it's going to have a relatively short rectum and of course an anus towards the posterior region of the animal. Now if you look down here towards the bottom you're going to notice the mouth of course is going to be located towards the anterior region or the front region of this animal and as we had said they have a very muscular pharynx. Now that pharynx has to be muscular because these animals tend to suck in their food. So the way that this pharynx works is that the muscles that surround the pharynx, when they contract, they tend to open up this area of the digestive tract. And when this area opens up, it tends to bring in the food from the environment. Now, as that food is being passed down the intestinal tract, those muscles are going to relax, which means that pharynx is going to be a little bit smaller. And so as it shrinks in size, it's going to continue to push that food down. Now, when that pharynx opens up again, it's going to bring more food in, and that's actually also going to help um, pass that previous food further down the track. So actually, as more food comes in, more food is going to be passed down. Now, in addition to um, the relaxing and the contracting of the pharynx and the bringing in of more food, these animals actually, as they move back and forth, they have sort of that characteristic thrashing um, movement that's also going to help to move um, that food down the intestinal tract. So as this food makes its way down, this intestine is actually very, very thin. It's only one cell thick, and so it's really easy for this animal to um, absorb nutrients from the food that it brings in. Now, again, as the food makes its way down, of course, any food that is not digested is going to have to leave that animal. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, we have the anus, of course, in the posterior region of the animal, but this anus is going to be very tightly closed. Now, defecation or release of metabolic waste can only occur when the muscles that are surrounding this anus actually contract and when they contract they help to pull open that anus. Now remember these animals are considered pseudocoelomates and so the gut tube of this animal is surrounded by lots of fluid and that fluid tends to put pressure on the outside of the animal or the cuticle region of this animal. So remember we refer to these animals as having a high hydrostatic pressure. Well, when this anus is pulled open then basically all that pressure is going to basically force all of that waste material out into the environment. So actually, it's a relationship between the muscles and that very high hydrostatic pressure that helps to um, remove waste from these animals. <clears throat> Now looking at the nervous system of the roundworms or the, the members of the phylum nematoda, you're going to notice that they have a ring of nerve tissue and ganglia that are going to surround the pharynx of the animal. And this nerve tissue is going to lead to a dorsal and a ventral nerve cord. And down here towards the bottom you can see a cross section of a roundworm. And the dorsal nerve cord is going to be right about here. And again, dorsal means top, so this is going to be along the top of the animal. And then towards the bottom, you're going to see the ventral nerve cord. Now these animals also have something called sensory papillates, and these are going to occur in the head region and the tail region of the animal. Now what a papillae is, is basically um, if you're looking at the head region of these animals, it's going to be very small sort of bumps or projections off the anterior region and, and the posterior region of the animal. It's kind of similar to the taste buds that we have on our tongue. Now these papillae can sense different types of um, stimuli in the environment. Um, in our case, of course, they pick up taste and for these animals they could pick up um, any type of maybe chemicals in the environment as well, so that would be a sense of taste. They could possibly even be a sort of a tactile type of sense, in other words a sense of touch, and they could possibly even pick up temperature as well. Now they also have a very special sense a set of um, sensory organs called amphids. Now these amphids are going to be located on the head region of the animal. 
Now there's actually a second set called phasmids, I'm going to put this over here off to the left, that occur in the posterior region of the animal, so sort of in the tail region of the roundworm. Now these amphids are going to be responsible for chemoreception in the animals. And so what they do is they basically um, are situated as a set of pores on each side of the animal's head. And if you look over here on the right, you can see sort of a blown up version of where these pores would be located. So this would be considered the amphidial pore. And again, we have one of these on each side of the head. Inside, you can notice that we have a pit and this pit is going to contain dendrites. Now dendrites are going to be the special neurons or, or nerve cells that are found in this area of the animal. And these dendrites are going to um, um, basically send up these extensions that would help to pick up um, various types of chemicals, etc., within the environment. And um, as we had said, the phasmids are going to be found in the sort of the tail region of the animals. They do exactly the same thing and they're set up exactly the same way. So both the amphids and the phasmids are special sensory organs that work in regards to chemoreception and roundworms. Now the reproductive system of these animals is pretty straightforward. Um, most of the animals in this group are considered dioecious, which means they have separate male and female um, representatives in the population. Now the males have what we call copulatory spicules, and you can see the spicule located right down here. And that spicule is there to hold open um, the female's reproductive opening, which is called the vulva. Now the reason that vulva tends to stay closed is, again, just kind of similar to the anus because of the immense or the large amount of hydrostatic pressure found within the animal. Remember, these animals are considered pseudocoelomates, so they have one central tube, but surrounding that tube is a lot of fluid, and that fluid puts a lot of pressure on the inside of the animal. Now, that pressure, of course, tends to keep any body opening closed. So there needs to be a way to open that um, body opening up. Now, the fertilization in these animals is considered internal, so once the male inserts that copulatory spicule, opens up the vulva, fertilization can be accomplished. Now the eggs are going to be stored in the uterus of the animal, and you can see the uterus located right here, and until of course they're going to be deposited into the environment. Um, these animals are a type of animal that undergoes something called direct development, and we're going to talk about insects a little bit later on in the year, and they have a type of development that's considered indirect development. Now the difference between the two is this. If you have an animal that has direct development, there's basically no larval stages. In other words, you don't have stages where the um, organism looks a little bit different from the adult. Basically meaning that once these eggs hatch, the um, larvae look pretty much like miniature adults. But as these animals grow, they do tend to shed their cuticle. Now, they have to shed their cuticle because that's the only way they can actually get larger. And there tends to be four juvenile stages in most members of nematodes. So as I had said at the beginning of our screencast, we're going to be looking at some representative members of the phylum nematoda. Now the first one we're going to look at is one called Ascaris lumbricoides. Now this is a type of roundworm that actually occurs in up to 25% of the people in some areas of the southeastern United States. This is actually one that you could pick up here in the U.S. Now there's more than 1.27 billion people that are affected with Ascaris worldwide, so it's actually a pretty common parasite. And what's unique about these worms is that the female Ascaris can lay as many as 200,000 eggs a day. And these eggs are typically passed out in the host's feces. So once the eggs have been deposited in the environment, they tend to remain viable um, even after signs of fecal matter have disappeared. Now they can actually survive for really long periods of time in the soil. And in fact, they're pretty resistant to the various chemicals that we might use in the environment as well. And that's one of the reasons why I want you guys to make sure that you wear your gloves as you work with the Ascaris. Now the host is going to swallow the embryonated or fertilized eggs, the juveniles are going to hatch, and they're going to burrow through the intestinal wall. Now once they burrow through this wall, they're going to be carried through the heart to the lungs, and then they're going to break into these very tiny pockets in our lungs called alveoli. Now once they break into those alveoli, they're actually going to be carried back up through our trachea, and our trachea is what's going to connect our mouth to our lungs, they're going to be actually coughed up, they're going to be re-swallowed or swallowed, and then they're going to mature in the intestine after about two months. Now once they've matured, that's when they're going to start to feed on the intestinal contents. Now if you get a really large infestation of Ascaris, they could possibly block or perforate 
or tear the intestines. Now the infection rates do tend to be higher in children because children tend to um, eat dirt, they tend to play in the soil, and even males tend to have a higher incidence of Ascaris as well simply because boys tend to um, put their hands in their mouth and play in the dirt a little bit more often than females do. So they tend to be more prevalent in males than in females. Now, hookworms is another example of a nematode that you can often find in the environment. Now, these animals tend to be about 9 to 11 millimeters in size, so that's about a centimeter in size, and they tend to have a hook-like curve to their body. Now, the sexes are separate, so they are dioecious, and these worms have large plates in the mouth to cut into the intestinal mucus or mucosa of the organism, and what they do is they simply suck the blood of the host. And over here you can see the um, sort of the teeth or those large plates that are found in these worms. Now, very heavy infections can actually cause anemia. Now, an anemia is basically when you have sort of a, a lack or a reduction in your red blood cell count. And of course, that would make sense because these animals are feeding off of the host's blood. Now, when they reproduce, the eggs are going to pass out in the feces and the juveniles are actually going to hatch in the soil. Now these are a little bit different from Ascaris, Ascaris because if human skin comes in contact with the soil, so for example, when you step into soil with these juveniles, these infected juveniles will actually burrow through the skin and make their way to your blood. And they're going to travel in the blood to the lungs, and kind of similar to Ascaris, they're going to be coughed back up, they're going to be re-swallowed, and then like the Ascaris, they're going to mature in the intestine, and then of course start feeding off of the host blood. So the third type of um, nematode that we're going to look at is one called a trichina worm. And if you are infected with trichina worms, you have a disease called trichinosis. Now the adult worms are going to burrow into the intestinal mucosa or the mucus of the intestines and the females are going to directly produce juvenile worms. So in this case, unlike the Ascaris, unlike the hookworms, um, these worms actually produce live offspring, so they don't have an egg laying phase. Now the juveniles are going to penetrate the blood vessels of the host and they're going to circulate throughout the body of the host. And again, different from the Ascaris and the hookworms, they will actually invade quite a bit of the tissue and the spaces that are found within that organism. Now they're going to primarily penetrate the skeletal muscle cells. Now what's interesting about these worms is they are considered an intracellular parasite, which means they actually parasitize individual cells within that host. And over here on the right you can see an example of one of these juveniles that has insisted itself within that skeletal muscle cell of its host. Now the way a person becomes infected with a trachina worm is if you eat poorly cooked meat and primarily game meats like meats you might take from maybe a deer for example or maybe bear meat and basically this meat contains the insisted juveniles of these worms and once you take them into your body they're going to be liberated in the digestive tract and they're going to mature in the intestine of the host. So one of the most common parasites in the U.S. is going to be a parasite called a pinworm. Now a pinworm is considered a nematode, but what's interesting is they cause very little disease unless you are really heavily infested with this type of nematode. Now the adults are going to live in the large intestine and the cecum of the host. Now the cecum is simply the beginning of the large intestine. Now the females are going to be about 12 millimeters long, so about a centimeter in length. Now what's neat about these worms is that they're going to migrate to reproduce and they're going to migrate to the anal region of their host and they tend to do this at night and this is going to be when they're going to lay their eggs and of course if they lay their eggs in the anal region of the organism us then it's going to cause a bit of itching and this tends to be the very first indication that you might be infected with pinworms now the scratching of the anal region is going to contaminate unfortunately your hands and of course anything else that you might touch for example your sheets maybe the bed clothes that you sleep in um, anything that you touch with contaminated hands could actually transmit these eggs now the eggs are going to develop pretty rapidly and they become infective within six hours at body temperature 
And if you happen to swallow these eggs, they're going to hatch in your duodenum and they're going to mature in your large intestine and the cycle is going to begin again. So down here towards the bottom you can see an example of a pinworm right here. Over here you can see an example of the eggs that you might find if you are infected. And on the far right hand side you can just barely see the pinworm and the large intestine of this individual. So the last group of nematodes that we're going to look at is one called the filarial worms. And there's lots of different species of filarial worms out there that infect lots of different parts of our body. Now most of these are going to live in the lymphatic system of the individual. Now the lymphatic system is going to be the system that actually regulates the um, amount of fluid that's going to be found within our body. Now when they are infecting the lymphatic system they tend to cause lots of inflammation and blockages of these lymphatic vessels. Now what this is going to do is it's going to cause a buildup of fluid within the um, host. Now the females are going to release live young tiny microfilaria into the blood and lymph system of their host. Now these are a little bit different from the um, nematodes we had talked about previously because these nematodes actually have an intermediate host which is a mosquito. So the mosquitoes are going to ingest the microfilaria when they actually feed off of an infected individual. Now the worms are going to develop to an infective stage and they're going to move into the mosquito bite wound when it feeds. Now one of the diseases that is caused by filarial worms is one called elephantiasis and it's caused by repeated exposure to these types of worms. Now, as we said, these worms invade the lymphatic system so they sort of screw up the ability of our bodies to maintain proper um, levels of fluid within different parts of our bodies. So they tend to cause swelling and growth of connected tissue and they can cause pretty enormous swelling in many parts of the body. So over here on the right hand side you can see an example of a filarial worm that's in the eye of this individual towards the top. So in the middle here you can see another example of a filarial worm and this person is doing its best to try to work the worm out of the person's body and what they're doing is they're actually taking this worm and wrapping it around a stick and maybe over a period of several days or several weeks they can draw the worm out. Now towards the bottom here this is a good example of the swelling and the growth of the connective tissue that we had talked about that if you are infected with again this type of worm it definitely plays havoc with your lymphatic system so it often means a large buildup of fluids in the extremities of its host. So that's going to be our second and last screencast for chapter 18. And again, as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.